In che condizioni era Rudy? Era che in ordine? Che in è disordine. la stanza dove mi affaccio nel guardare le persone che scappano. E chi vede quando, quando si affaccia? Vedo la, no, la Nox che se ne va via insieme a questa sagoma maschile, a questa persona, a questa figura maschile. Sì, sì. Ecco. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. I'm Laura Richards, advocate, analyst and activist and director and founder of Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service and co-creator and producer of CBS's The Case of John Bonet Ramsey. And I'm in the studio with... Jim Clementi, retired FBI profiler, former New York City prosecutor and writer and producer on CBS's Criminal Minds. And I am Lisa Zambetti. I am the casting director for Criminal Minds and Criminal Minds Beyond Borders, where Jim Clementi is my colleague. And I have a real interest in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So our listeners, if you've been following um, the last few pods, we've been talking about the murder of Meredith Kircher in Perugia. And we spent quite a bit of time in the last podcast talking about one particular interview, and it's the interview of Rudy Guede, um, that took place apparently in the prison, in Viterbo prison, on January the 22nd. And this is his first interview that he's given. Um, and we've been really just talking through each of the sections that you'll be able to find online. It's in parts and there's English subtitles as well that goes goes with those parts. And where we got up to was Guede's account, which now starts to get very interesting about that particular night, um, that on November the 1st where Meredith Kircher is alone in the villa and the interviewer Franco Liasini sets him up talking about, you know, how did he get entry to the villa and she sort of talks about him, you know, did you climb the wall like a gecko to go into this villa and steal or, you know, were you breaking in for a sex game party and sort of laughs it off and sort of jokes it off as being something that's quite ridiculous and he then starts to give his account having mirrored what she said of um, how he got in and he his version of events is actually that Meredith Kircher opened the door for him um, because they had a date they had a predetermined yeah. date that he was going to meet her there right and he wants to say that it's romantic he wants to say that it's based on that kiss at the club um, the alleged kiss yeah the alleged kiss that nobody saw the alleged fact that he um was in uh the domus pub at the same time that she was she was there with her friends he was apparently there with his friends no one saw them together at any point right and you know it's just clearly again him trying to set a foundation for why he was in in Meredith Kircher's home and in her room and why her blood is all over him and his fingerprints and DNA are all over her in the room um, and inside her as well, by the way. So um, he's trying very hard to make a plausible excuse for being there. The fact is it falls very short because we'll go into the detail. You'll see that, that this all falls apart. So he says that he got invited in because uh, they had prearranged that he would be meet her at the cottage uh, that night. And so he, he showed up and she let him in. And she then locked the door from the inside. And uh, they uh, he asked her for something to drink and she offered him to just serve himself in the refrigerator. And he had a juice drink and all these little details and that's so wonderful. And... Then they were, quote, in a good mood. And I think what he was trying to say is that they were horny. And so they started fooling around with each other. They didn't have, according to him, sexual intercourse, but they did engage in, in heavy petting. Well, there's um, a step before that where he, his account says that she, he helps himself to a fruit juice in the, in the fridge. She then goes to her bedroom, which again seems very strange that she just disappears at that point. She then comes back and complains that she's unhappy with mm. one of her housemates. Right. And he says, obviously, there had been disagreements between the two girls. That's all that's said about the detail at that stage. 
he asks why what's what she upset about and quote he says she said that she was mad at Knox because she had stolen money for from her and that she's filthy and that she didn't clean and that he then tries to comfort her and tries to bring her back to reason he said these are serious accusations stealing money right and so something that um he again wants to be on the moral high ground but they go from these serious accusations to all of a sudden being horny and ripping each other's clothes off. Um, And, you know, again, I think it's absurd. Uh, The situation, uh, you know, is just, again, an an attempt on his part to explain his being in there. Um, And he said that that, um, it got to the point where she asked him if he had a condom. He said, I don't, don't you? And he, at that point, tries to malign her by saying, well, she has... Uh, other boyfriend, so she should have had a condom, but she didn't. Uh, it was... And that he wouldn't go with her unless she did. And right. this kind of projection or transference onto her that she's the one who's questionable in her sexual conduct right. versus his. I yeah. thought that was a very He's interesting a interplay. Yes, of course he would never have sex with a woman without it. And he said, like other boys, and he said boys, who find themselves in this situation, he knew that this was not the appropriate time to keep going, so they just stopped that, and then they got dressed. It doesn't sound uh, probable no, at all not to at all. young people in that situation, particularly the way that he describes her really does sit at odds with everything, well, the things that we've heard about her through her family and through her friends. And Plus he's making it very clear that he's not the kind of guy who would who would push a girl to have sex with him just because rape. they were, or, yeah, right. I mean, right. he's sort of making, yeah. At the but other end of the spectrum. As again. if, right, as if the only thing that to people of that age could do sexually was have sexual intercourse and uh, it just it it just strange logic and strange reality uh, reality the interviewer's kind of reaction to him i find even more peculiar in some sense that she then says but you missed the best part of the evening right and then you know to quote the movie no sex please we're british i mean this i'm sorry i have to that this was so offensive to me and I don't even understand why but when she said this and she's like laughing it's like there's a fucking girl who was murdered you know I mean I, it was just so inappropriate the way that she said that am I am I talk me off the ledge am no, I crazy? no no stay on the ledge because it's exactly consistent with what I said earlier she's flirting with him that's what she's doing and it's it, and he's flirting with her she could get two shits about Meredith in this you know, know she says this whole thing is about Meredith no she doesn't care she does not I know she's there to <laughs> feed his ego. I mean, it's clear from the first words out of her mouth, and it's clear from the whole tone of this interview that that's what she's doing. She successfully does it throughout. She hands him softballs to to just hit out of the park, and I don't know what the cricket version of that same statement would be, but he she definitely lobs them to him so he can do what he wants with them. And even when she purports to get tough with him. He then dances around the answer and then never actually answers the questions and she never follows up. It's it's just it's wrong. And it's insulting and it's all the things that that you said, Lisa. I mean, you know, I I find it not just bizarre, but it's so oddly placed and out of context that I you know, it's difficult to intuit really what's going on behind the scenes for someone to come out and make that very flippant, inappropriate comment. Yeah, that's at, what it was. It was her stage. flippant tone. It's just so just tone deaf I mean I just anyway all right but he sort of just laughs it off and you know then starts to say that they got dressed and then he says you know he had a bad stomach um, and he had to go to the bathroom and you know my sort of read of this is actually this is probably true and the kernel of truth is that he probably did have some form of spicy kebab you know beforehand and his stomach probably you know, did feel uncomfortable and he did go to the bathroom. Well, we know that to be factually true because of the feces that are left in the toilet. And the toilet paper that he put around the seat and so forth had his DNA on it. But in all likelihood, that happened before Before. Meredith came home and that she came home while he was in there and surprised him. Sat on the toilet. Right. And, And then, of course, at that point, he would have been trapped in there. If he had flushed the toilet, then she would have known somebody else was in there. He probably waited for her to get back into her room, to go into her room in the back of the house, and then thought 
I can sneak out when she does that quietly. Of course, wasn't able to do that because the door actually is locked with a key from the inside. And the bathroom choice was interesting as well because there were two bathrooms, weren't there? And this was the one furthest away right. from her bedroom. Right. But again, he explains it that she tells him to use that bathroom. But it seemed an odd choice, you know, if they were in the. Uh, they said they were full. He was. He said that they were in the lounge, the salon, kitchen kind of area, and then they went to the bedroom. But it's still an odd choice to go into that bathroom. Right. But him being in that bathroom, you know, he's got to account for certain things, hasn't he? And, of course, he knows the things uh, that were put within the prosecution's case. He knows right. the things that were found. Um, so, you know, his account, the, the timings, no doubt, are the things that change. Right. But he tries to thread through the, the, the kernel of truth, the things that did happen that he has to explain away. Right. And one of the things, as I was listening to him explain what happened supposedly when he was in the bathroom, was that he heard the doorbell ring. And and then shortly after that, Meredith opens the door and engages in an argument with Amanda Knox. And he's 100 percent certain it's her because he paid attention to her voice. He's 101 percent. Right. 101 percent sure. And here's the he thing. He reiterates it twice. So it's actually 202 percent. Yes, sure. that's right. But here's the fallacy there. Amanda lived there. Amanda has keys to this place. Why would Amanda ring the doorbell? Oops, sorry, Rudy, you screwed up. And she actually, Franca, actually catches him on that later and says, well, why would she do that? And he, and he switches it. He said, well, of course, open the door with her key from the outside. Then she comes inside and puts her key in and closes the lock from the inside with her key. He totally sidesteps the question. She doesn't follow through. No, Amanda would not have to ring the doorbell. There would be no reason for her to be ringing the doorbell. Why would she do it? She lived there. She had a set of keys. She would have used them in order to get into her own apartment. But that was one of the flaws in Rudy's quote. But he does story. try and cover it off because, I, you know, that was one thing that I went back to, his account on that. And he does cover it off very specifically, as you said, where he says the, the key was actually in the door. Yeah, he I don't think the key was in the door. I think she did. Probably, she probably was security conscious. And as lone females, when you come back from somewhere and, and you're the only one in the house, the first thing you tend to do is lock the door. Now, I would be interested to know what her baseline behavior was, whether, you know, people who she lived with would say that that's what they would each do or they made a point, you know, around security. But I think she probably did lock the door because that's why he's caught on the on the toilet but probably doesn't leave the key in it because otherwise he would have been made good his escape. But that but wasn't even the question he that he was on his, He thinks on his feet, and I think that's what it shows me, the ability that Roll. she does catch him out, but he then becomes very detailed and very specific, and the hand gesticulations start coming in. And, you know, this is kind of what happened. He's encouraging and inviting her to believe his version of events. And before that, he actually says, and it was something that you know, intrigued me that when she starts, when he starts talking about being in the bathroom, he says, look, I really just, I just want to clarify this point now. I'm very clean. You know, he's already thinking that people might judge him because he left the feces in the toilet. So now he cares he's about to, the feces. He cares, he cares about, about that, it. but not, not the, the, the blood. Body. The that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even though he says later on, you know, I'm a poor boy, I'm panicking and I've, yeah, I find myself in Germany. I don't know how. So these things, again, are incongruent and at, at, at odds. But I think that 101% showing that he's overextending and his ability, actually, you know, that he can, when challenged, he can bring another layer to it. Right. But again, it's not the question she asked him. She was asking, why would Amanda Knox need to ring the doorbell? If she lived there, she had a set of keys, she could have let herself in. But he switches to Meredith's perspective and say that she opened the door with the key and then locked it again and put the key in on the inside. And we'll get to this later, but originally he said she was, Amanda Knox was never even there. Right, I, mean, he, I know that, he, he, right. Yeah, and we'll, we'll compare that later. Yeah. Yes, of course. And but identifying someone by voice, you know, is interesting. Well, that, and that, <laughs> identifying somebody by voice, if you only, you've only heard a couple of times speaking, one, that's just complete garbage but two while you're listening to very loud music music in, in your ears and he does listen to it very loud by the way he reiterates this point we even see a little clip of someone who looks like him on the toilet listening to music dancing we could have done without that 
We well, really what he could says have. is he heard the girls arguing, and he didn't want to listen anymore to the arguing. So then he put that's why he put them on his ears and was turned up well, the volume really loud. Yeah, he said but, that, but yeah. that's inconsistent with what he said earlier, mm-hmm. which is when he timed how long he was in the bathroom. He said it was it was about ten or eleven minutes because he listened to three songs, two and a half songs actually. So he couldn't have waited until. He heard them arguing to put the earphones on because he said he was only in there for 10 or 11 minutes total. Mm -hmm. So another inconsistency, an inconsistency, unfortunately, that was not challenged. And the devil's in the detail. That's exactly the point. We would pay attention to those details. If I was the one interrogating him, he would not get away with that. But this is the kind of thing why I know it's a lie. If it weren't a lie, then there would be no reason to do to say inconsistent things. Yeah, sometimes people's memories aren't perfect, but the fact is that he is selling this 101%. He's telling us he's absolutely certain this is what happened. It's wrong. And staying in the bathroom for my own good time, 10 to 11 minutes, he has to account for a period of time, then saying that he's listening to these songs and he even names one song, these kind of details that he is bringing up, but the other things he's very vague on. And forensically, does he already know that the attack that happened to Meredith took about 10 minutes? I mean, is that where he's getting this 10-minute number from, do you think? Mm, I don't know. I think it, the 10 minutes in the bathroom could be absolutely true. And I, the fact that he got interrupted in the middle of listening to a song could absolutely be true because that's those kernel of truths that he stretches into these lies. But the interruption was most likely Meredith Kircher coming home and it was certainly not Amanda ringing the doorbell. Uh, we know that as a fact that it didn't happen. And we know as a fact that Meredith was, that his DNA was on the sleeve of Meredith's jacket that was pulled off of her. And that he was in the bedroom with her and he carried a knife. There's impressions of that knife, that of a knife that he, consistent with the pocket knife that he carried, on bloody impressions on the bed itself. And so just everything that he's tried to weave together as a story, as a comprehensive story about what he did and what happened to Meredith, falls apart completely right from the start of his lies about the bathroom and being interrupted. The next step, I don't know if we're going to go to that, is then he hears a scream. And of course, louder than his music, louder than his music. And of course, he he has to hurry up. And that's why he didn't he flush the flush. toilet. He says it again. Right. Uh, he's very concerned about that image point. And then he runs to um, he runs to Meredith's room because at that point, all the other lights are off. So then he hears uh, a very loud scream, and of course he's already referenced that his music's on very loud. Right. And he forgets to flush because now he is sort of active, wondering what's going on, and that's another important point right. for he's him. He's so concerned about his image, so concerned. We're talking about the murder of a 20-year-old girl, and he's concerned about his image in terms of cleanliness, in terms of flushing the toilet. I mean, it's out, It's absurd. Doesn't want to be judged on that. And right. Yet he's convicted of murder, but that again. He is leaves a, new a tissue. dying girl. According to him, he leaves a dying girl alone in the apartment without running for help or calling for help. Right. And that's not as important as flushing the toilet. And being judged on that. Right. But he his story is at this point. His story is that he then runs to the back hallway, a hallway that is now darkened. That all the lights are now off. They were on before. He said, but. Why would the lights have to be dark? Because in his story, he doesn't recognize the person. He didn't get a good look at his face. Yet, he describes in detail the name on the shirt that this attacker supposedly was wearing. Yeah, the brand of it. And so he then says that he got to Meredith's room, and her light was the only light that was on. And this guy was facing away from him towards Meredith. And he almost reached out to touch him to find out what happened. And the guy turned around and started slashing at him with this knife. And he says, Oh, scalpel. Well, this is what's important about what he says at this point. Okay. He says, It happened so fast. And during the interrogation and trial, I said that I didn't know what was in his hands. I said, I thought it was a scalpel. What's important is the two times he said, I said. Because now he's talking about what he testified to. 
He's not talking about what happened. Mm -hmm. He takes us out of the moment. When you're recounting an event, you don't then skip ahead to an interrogation and skip ahead to a trial. You're you're talking about you're the moment. You're telling the truth yeah. about you what just happened. Recount, it's an account. Right. You recount what happened. You don't say, and when I testified, I said this. That's a pure example of a lie, of an out and out lie. Deception. There's no way that somebody who experienced those events as he's recounting it would say that this is what we call leakage. He's leaking out information. He's saying, yes, at this point in the story, I have to skip ahead. I have to skip ahead to when I testified about this because that's the story I'm sticking to. He has to fix it. He has to fix the lie. He has to stick with what he's said. And he cannot be inconsistent and he's very aware of this. Yes, but he's not aware of the fact that it shows that what he's doing now is trying to keep to the story that he lied about when he testified and when he was interrogated. But this is classic cognitive load, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. It's very hard to... To keep all those details... In your head, particularly when you've got... I mean, the interviewer is not brilliant, as we know, but she now does start to press him yeah, on some does. of the detail. And I say that, that he says that... Guede says, he turned around and came at me. Right. Okay, so he's, he's saying... He's right there he's, in the he, moment. Yes, he's seen this person. He came at me, meaning right. I have to have seen his face. Right. My eyes must have seen this person. But I don't know what was in his hand. And at the trial and when I was interrogated, I said... And then he quotes himself. He's quoting himself in an earlier rendition, but he's not actually in the moment anymore. He's not telling the story of what happened that day. He's telling the story of what he said about what happened that day. And he's trying to recall what he said because we see now with his baseline wildly gesticulating hands. I mean, we see that through some of the interview, but even more so at this point, and he's struggling for words. Right. This isn't a a flow of conversation recounting the truth. This is somebody who's grasping and grappling. You can see the cognitive load, and he wants to try and get it right. Well, he wants to get it right because I believe, and when we get to talking about McNeedy, I believe that he was fed information, and I've read his interrogation by McNeedy, the first interrogation by the police on this topic. I read that in great detail. And I saw over and over and over again where McNeeny fed him facts and eventually he adopted them and put them in his story. And that's the story he was trying to remember in this interview here, not what actually happened in that apartment that day. That's kind of what the interviewer does. I mean, she says, so how is it that you, in the trial, you remember the insignia on his shirt, but you don't remember his face? I mean, she kind of tees it up for him to say, oh, it was... So it was so upsetting. I didn't know what in, to think. in the next part, but I think just still with that particular section, mm-hmm. what's interesting is the drop of where well, the German police found that you had a cut on your hand. Right. And so this is brought in immediately, you know, with this scalpel right. and obviously giving an account for right. why he has injuries and, and, a, and a cut on his hand. Yes. And so what she does is she tees it up for him yet again. Oh, this is one of the reasons why you can't remember his face because you were focused on that scalpel in his hand. Of course, he says, I said I didn't know what was in his hand. During the interrogation and trial, I said that I didn't know what was in his hand. I said I thought it was a scalpel. And the reason why he has to reiterate I thought it was a scalpel is because in the trial, the prosecution used him to try to prove that they stabbed her with a knife that was 12 inches long with a 7-inch blade. It was scary so they could wave it in front of the jury. And that was not consistent with what Gator had said. So he said, I thought it was a scalpel. I didn't know what was in his hands, but I thought it was a scalpel because I got cut. Right. And I think, you know, I mean, forensics would be able to determine, looking at that cut, the angle, the blade, you know, exactly how, or would, would be able to opine how that injury came about. I'm not sure whether that was ever done. I don't um, know, but the the fact is that, you know, if we, we go to Meredith's own injuries, that that the knife that they tried to put in, that McNini tried to put into evidence, or did put into evidence as the murder weapon, clearly could not have made the wounds on Meredith's body, and it was only because the defense so much pressure on that theory that in the end McNini argued, well, there were two knives. Yeah, there were two <laughs> knives. You know, Like, I'm sorry I lapsed into the, the character of the liar from Saturday Night Live, but that's all I can I can say for Rudy Gede and mm. 
McNeeny, they both are avid and professional and very accomplished liars, and they do not give a damn about the truth. They do not give a damn about other people, and they've just they've perverted justice. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm very pissed at Rudy Guede for killing Meredith Kircher. But I'm even more pissed off at McNeeny for perverting justice and for misleading Meredith's family and for not giving her the justice of of actually locking up the person who sexually assaulted and murdered her for any more than what turns out to be about seven years. Just outrageous. And it's that sort of collusion and... Um, you know, we're we're talking a little bit more about McNeeny in a in a separate section because I think it warrants it and the system. And this section in particular ends with him saying that this man tries to flee and that Guede sort of backs out of his way and then he sees the man fleeing with Knox, and that's sort of how it ends. So I think when we come back, let's talk a little bit more about his description of this particular man and exactly what he says happened. Hello, it's Jim Clementi and Francie Hakes with a special message about a new show that I'm hosting on Wondery called Locked Up Abroad. In each episode, people tell their harrowing stories of being convicted of crimes and jailed in foreign lands, or kidnapped and held hostage in war-torn countries. These are definitely worst-case, worst-case scenarios. They're truly frightening situations. Yes, no best cases here. But it is fascinating to hear how they manage to survive these ordeals. In the first episode, Midnight Express, Billy Hayes tells us about being imprisoned in Turkey for smuggling hashish. Oliver Stone even made a movie about it. But that was the movie. This is the real story. I even had the chance to interview Billy Hayes recently, and he told me the whole story behind the story of how he escaped a Turkish prison. He even told me that he went back to Turkey years later. You have to hear his story to believe it. And now, in his own words, here is Billy Hayes. Questa assurda incongrua messa in scena l'ha organizzata lei? Assolutamente no. Let's get more into detail about what Guede says this guy looked like and what he did and what he said after Guede came out of the bathroom. Well, Guede says that Amanda Knox was, he saw Amanda Knox walking away. Um, and that Outside. This, outside, and that, it's, you know, that it was said, black man found. Right. Well, a couple things. Um, one of the statements that he made to Mignini, I believe it was, in his, his interrogation, when Mignini kept asking, he kept saying, well, you must have seen her, you must have seen her, you must have seen her. He eventually, Guede eventually said to Mignini, well... I saw her silhouette going off in the night. I didn't see her face, but I recognized her. Silhouette identification along with a voice identification. (laughs) So we have a voice identification after a couple of meetings, brief meetings. In a bar that's busy. Yes, over over the music playing in his earphones. And then we have a silhouette identification, which... Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first time ever in the, in the history of law enforcement that somebody has actually been able to put a silhouette identification into a court of law as an identification. It's just completely absurd. Doesn't happen, has absolutely no weight in law, is, is completely, it's just McNini being, pushing his agenda of trying to get somebody to identify Amanda Knox here. But we'll get into McNini a little later. But as you said, Guede claims that he heard this man, and it's interesting, he doesn't call him Raffaele Solecito. He says but, like. Yes, he says, but he is kind of like, you know, he's a little shorter than me, and he he, uh, he had a hat on. Right? A beret. I mean, this description's oh. very peculiar. Yeah, like a beret and a red band around the head smaller than him, a brand <laughs> jacket. I mean, it's all suitably yeah. vague, isn't it, apart right. from... The, the branding on the jacket. Or the actual physical features of the person that's waving this knife at you. But he says that as he was running away, he said, called out to the other person who he's 100%, 101% certain was Amanda Knox by her voice earlier because she rang the doorbell, which she didn't have to do in the first place. Don't forget the silhouette. Yes, and the silhouette later. I, I think he heard first, and then he said, let's let's run before they, they come here or they catch us or whatever. Um black man found and which is an odd thing 
to hear or say anyway. Right. Well, I think what he's trying to imply is that, hey, there's a black guy here. Great. We just killed Meredith Kircher. And now there's a black guy here that we can blame it on. So now, apparently, he interprets this as a black black man found black man found guilty. So he panics. But he's also a hero. Thank you, everybody. He's a hero. Yes, he finds Meredith Kircher bleeding out in her be- bedroom, and what does he do? He runs around the out of her bedroom, around the corner to the bathroom, and grabs a towel. Comes back and tries to stop the bleeding. It's ineffective. So what does he do again? He runs out of the bedroom into the bathroom and grabs another towel and comes back and tries yet again to stop her bleeding. And that doesn't work. So what does he do again? He runs out of the bedroom and to the bathroom and grabs a third towel. And that still, still didn't work. And he says he left her and she was alive. But in another rendition, he says he left her and she had already stopped moving. Um, somehow in this whole set of circumstances, he's able to run into Filomino's room, which is the opposite direction of the bathroom where he went to get these towels, and he sees the silhouette of Amanda Knox running away with this man, this unknown man, who just happens to have fair resemblance to Raphael Solecito, but he didn't want to say that because he didn't want to get sued or something. But the fact is that he's able to make this silhouette identification uh, that doesn't exist, and he does that in a in a time period where there's a dying woman on the floor. For some reason, what's more important to him than actually helping Meredith Kircher is to go to another bedroom down the hall and look out the window and identify these people. Why does he have to identify them? Why does he have to identify Amanda if he's already 101% certain it was Amanda? Why does he have to look at her running away when he's already said, I know she was in here and she's not here anymore? There's no reason for him to have to do that other than to appease the prosecutor who wants somebody to be a witness to testify that Amanda was there. Just like the the bum and the, you know, and the uh, drug addicts that he brings in, that McNeely brings into trial later to say like a year or year and a half after the fact that they all of a sudden remembered that, yes, they saw these these people together, Guede, uh, Selecito, and, and Knox. Anyway, it's very clear when McNeely's work and um, mischaracterization of the facts and his pressuring of people with deals, it's very clear when that happens. And just along that line, since we're here, if you don't mind my digressing just a little bit, but McNeeny ends up giving Guede a fast track trial, which means that that he's basically, as a concession, um, going to get a shorter uh, sentence. sentence as a result of this trial because he agrees to do it fast track. Well, part of that typically is that he would have to testify in any subsequent trial against Selecito and Knox, but he doesn't. He takes the stand, he's gets called to the stand by the defense in uh, by Knox's and Selecito's attorneys, and and he takes what we would call the Fifth Amendment here. He he raises his right against self-incrimination. Well, he should have that should have been part of the deal that if he gets this fast-track t- trial and a lower sentence, he should have to cooperate and testify in the trial against them. The prosecution didn't call him as a witness. The prosecution, think about that. The prosecution of Amanda Knox and Rafael Selecito did not use him as a witness when that they're saying make any that sense. it doesn't at all. It doesn't at all. Um, well, like so much of this doesn't make any sense. I mean, Guede's explanation for why the fast track um, at the end of this interview, and we've kind of jumped along yeah, to the end, which I want to make sure we circle back. Oh, yeah, yeah. But he's asked specifically why, why oh, the I fast didn't know, track. Oh, I didn't hear that far in the interview. I, I, didn't, I wouldn't have jumped to it 
I didn't know. I was just talking about the legal part of it. Which is fascinating. And I, I don't know whether we cover it now or wait. Well, we could wait then. I didn't know it, it came back up because I didn't hear the whole interview. I got sick after a while of <laughs> listening, listening to, to his. Uh, I just wanted to circle back for a second because both Jim and Laura have laid out so well, you know, what did happen in Mayor of This Room and how she she did fight so hard, you know, the blood spray, all of that all around the room. Does what Guede says happen, that some guy ran in, stabbed her, and ran out? I mean, that just doesn't hold up. I mean, oh. that's why I asked you earlier about how long he says he was in the bathroom, Is if that's significant, that he has to say he was there for that long to to say that, no, actually, this single this single assailant did, you know, struggle with her. And, and I mean, does he, is he saying that that person did all that, or no, it was just in and out? Do we know? Well, he's trying to say that this person did it. Um but he also said that, inconsistently with the facts, said that when he left Meredith, that the room was tidy, that she just bled out on the floor and that he had tried to wipe it up and tried to stop the bleeding. Well, he was trying to stop the bleeding, but there was also just a part before that where he says that Meredith is saying af, you know, af, and trying to say something to him. And then he is trying to write... Write it on the wall, on, on in, the wall her in her blood. blood. I mean, okay, Really? That's there's a desk right there. Why would you? He was trying to say why his hand sure. was bloody on the wall. So I think the point for for your question, because if we stick to this particular part where mm-hmm. he now says, "Well, I was a poor twenty year old boy. I, you know, I just had blood on my hands. I was soiled with blood, and fear overtook, and I just had to leave." You know, my big question there was, "Well, why didn't you call for help? Why didn't you alert anybody?" And you know, of course, he's trying to now fit. And, and make this narrative make sense. Right. So the time, you know, he knows what everybody else is guesstimating as the time window for this offence to take place. He has placed himself at the scene. He now needs to have a narrative and construct it from the kernels of truth that there are to make it make sense. So, you know, whether it's 10 minutes, 11 minutes, you know, however long this particular, you know, in his mind, this other person rushing in. But of course, the, there's a big problem here. What's the motive? You know, how does this person get in when when the door's locked? What's the motive, you know, that he's there? And, you know, how long it took, who knows? But we know... Well, good he knows. (laughs) Yeah, because we know who was in that address. We know what the forensics, when you look at all of it, what is the thing that is much more likely and highly probable. But what we hear in his narrative is about how painful it is for him and how he was overwhelmed and how he felt fear and... You know, we hear the victim claim again that he is taking the victim role. And again, he's trying to, in this particular account, make the listener, the viewer, everyone feel sympathy for him, which, of course, distracts and diverts from her of, you know, what was really going on. So I think there are these bigger missions. Um, You know, he has to construct an account. So that's all that he's doing is trying to make his narrative, his reason for being there, everything makes sense and weaving in amongst the kernels of truth that there are. Right. But what it brought up for me, and I'm just going to, I have mentioned this before, that I that I actually did witness a stabbing once when I was very young. And um, the way that Guida said it in the interview, it sounds to me like he's saying he hears a scream, he comes out, and there's a man who's run into the room, stabbed her, and has left. So I actually saw somebody do that, somebody run into a room and stab somebody and leave. Um, and as you guys have pointed out, her death occurred with, Slashes and you know her fighting. Yes, 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 yes. yes. There's a struggle. So the stabbing that I saw actually had very little blood because the assailant basically punched my friend in the throat, but he had a knife in his hand. So so yeah, it was like boom, boom, right? And um, I can't believe we just squinted when I said we will cut this side. Because you, Uh, I know. Thumping your own. I know. I'm sorry. Usually I'm the one who gets a little. Okay. Um. And he was he he went boom boom and then he ran out and and he had fallen over from the force of it and kind of staggered up and that's where we saw the stab and we were able to put pressure on it with some pizza napkins but it wasn't like you've described arterial spray mm-hmm. you know so was the the offender in that case did he mm-hmm. get caught yes had he been we talked about this one time of our first we did podcast, didn't we but did did he spend time had he been in jail before I I don't know. I don't know. They never that that looks like that's would you describe that to me and showed mm-hmm. me that that mm-hmm. looks like what 
what prisoners would do to really? shiv somebody. Yeah, really? it yeah. has to be quick in yeah. and out and it, because they, they have seconds to do it. Highly targeted functional. Right. right. So I bumped against that when I was, you know, in my untrained mind. I, that's what I bumped against when Greta was explaining was saying that, but I also bumped against him saying that he turned and faced me and ran out and he couldn't remember his face because I will never forget this guy's face, you know, and that's how fast I saw it. And he said he was close enough. He was about to touch him. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like they were across a crowded room. It wasn't like he was down the hall. He was in the only lit room Mm -hmm. and he was standing there in a darker hallway into a lit room. So the light is on this guy. I mean, why can't he identify his face hmm. but then you know the, the fact is that he's clearly lying and when when he says that as you said Laura that he was fleeing out of fear he was afraid that he was gonna get not it wasn't that he was afraid that he was gonna get killed it was afraid that he was gonna get blamed for this crime that's what he's saying and he was so horrified by it all this blood and the poor little boy that he was of 20 years Yet, what does he do? He goes out drinking with his friends. That is not something that somebody who's afraid of uh, getting uh, prosecuted does unless what he's doing is setting an alibi. What he's doing is establishing an alibi so that people will say he was here so that nobody's going to link him back to that crime. That's what he did. It's very clear. He said he ran out of the country because he was afraid but if he was afraid, why did he spend the time to go to the bar and go drinking with his friends? Why did he dance that night? He's he was having a great old time. And, you know, alibying himself. So, again, it's, it's incongruent. These things do not make sense of his account, the things that he's threading. Mm. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a relatively um, clever narrative, really, because of the kernels of truth. But then it falls down with these great big inconsistencies and challenges, um, you know, and this... Uh, element that he always wants to be seen as the victim, you know, claiming victimhood, which you see um, a lot of the time with, you know, those narcissists or um, certainly, um, you know, psychopathy. But I think this particular section where he, she is questioning him, why didn't you call for help? Any six-year-old boy would have called for help. And then he says, well, you know, I was a cow, but he actually starts talking over her. It's a, for a very one of the very few times very where he... Assertive. Yeah. And you start to see probably more the 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 real him, the true him. Um, and once they they go, she goes into part seven where she says, "Well, the investigators didn't believe your account. Um, you rushing out of the bathroom in haste." And he brings up the not flushing the toilet again, which you know is returned to three or four times, but not having this description. And as you said, Lisa, you remember that face. You can probably still conjure it up in your head. Unfortunately, you know when there's something that's that's traumatic. Um, and this is the only bit really where she starts to press him saying that, you know, it's it's seen as an unconvincing account um, that him saying also that it happened within this 10 to 11 minute time frame. Can I also just say that one thing that disturbs me so much is that the sad fact is that black people do get blamed for crimes. And and, uh, and certainly in the United he, States. Yes, they in do. the US and I'm sure plenty of other places. And that he's lumping himself in with people who really are, are falsely accused. Are falsely accused and you know, what do you what do you call it, Jim? Arrested for being black or pulled over for being black. Yeah, I mean and it's black. Yes. Yeah. And it's horrible. And for him to try to leverage that if that in, is indeed what he's doing is is so disgusting. Does it remind you of anybody with the initials O J? Well, it does a little bit. A lot. I mean, this is exactly the same kind of situation. You have somebody who's charismatic, who wants to be looked at as the victim, who obviously, you know, wants people to believe that he's the nicest guy in the world. Um, And in fact, I think it's pretty clear they're both murderers. So when we come back, let's talk about what he says next happened, about how he left Meredith um, and some of the details about the crime scene, which seem very interesting. E quando entro nella stanza della Filomena, eh, la stanza è tutta in ordine. È in ordine. So let's talk about what Guede says in part eight. Um, in particular, he starts with saying that when he left Meredith Kircher, she was fully dressed. 
Well, that makes a lot of sense. So in his story, this unknown man who shares a lot of characteristics with Raphael Selecito and this woman, Amanda Knox, um, had an, uh, Amanda had an argument with Meredith, um, decided to solicit the help of Raphael Selecito, who she'd known for five or six days at this point, and, and uh, they killed her. They killed Meredith and then ran away. The room was pristine, and uh, other than the fact that Meredith had bled there um, and everything else was in order except for one drawer that was pulled out, um, and these people ran away, and he saw them run away from Philomena's room clearly, which was undisturbed at that time, according to his story. And yet, the next day, when Raffaele and Amanda came back, there was actually glass all over, clothes thrown over, the, the laptop in the middle of the floor, the shutters open, the window broken, and a duvet over Meredith, and bloody mess all over the room, and blood spatter that could not have happened after she died that had to have happened while she was breathing, this aspirated blood spray or spatter. All of this somehow magically occurred that they came back to the house and did all this staging, even though they know that this other person, Rudy Gede, who Gede says Amanda knew him, so certainly if he, if he saw her, she must have seen him. If Raphael had turned and slashed at him with his scalpel and cut his hand, Raphael must have told Amanda that, that, that he was there, that there was another person there. So why would they risk coming back to the house to stage this as a burglary and just so happen to fall upon his M.O. for breaking into houses on the second floor? I mean, it's just so absurd, so ridiculous. I just feel bad for anybody who actually believes that crap. Mm -hmm. And whether they're very well educated or not very well educated, the fact is they've been misled because that did not happen. There and is and not this is where she does sort of dig in a little bit and say to him, well, the judges didn't believe your version of events. Um, you know, and him reiterating again, it was tidy and ordered when he left and the door was open. And I, th I think this part was quite interesting where they used the crime scene video um, in this interview and mm -hmm. they showed what was found at 12.30 and she does ask a good question I think at this point to say well why would someone come back and alter the crime scene why would they do something at the crime scene and sort of questions him about why How you know, does he answer? Well he just basically says that you know reiterates that he left her fully clothed he even details the clothing that she was wearing which again was very interesting when he can't remember the face of the person mm -hmm. who is not only um, stabbing Meredith in front of him but is also a threat to his own life you know obviously if he does confront this person he doesn't know whether this person's going to try and stab him right. he's, he's now in the fight or flight his adrenaline will be surging so this guy is a threat to him but he remembers all these little details and so she um, Franca then says well of course we do know that Philomena's room was in disarray um, Meredith Kircher was on the floor, her left foot was showing, her face was showing, there was blood everywhere, you know, she was partially clothed, she reiterates that, and then she says that the um, the crime scene was staged, and she says it, it was a, it a break-in that was staged, um, and so she reiterates that as fact. I'm not then, moved by her interpretation of the evidence there, Laura, sorry. Well, me neither, which, you know, I just wrote, this is not correct. But then she goes further to say that there was glass and there was a rock on top of the clothes and that she says the rock was thrown from the inside. She doesn't give any reason <laughs> for saying this um, other than that the glass and the rock was on top of clothes and that there was no trace of Guede in Philomena's room. Therefore, he did not, he was not the, no, she asked him, did you stage it? Rudy and he says no and she sort of surmises oh, oh, oh well, okay. he didn't. well he would never lie of course he would no no he's such an honorable person and he flushes the toilet except for this one time on this one occasion where yeah. he's caught short but he then gets quite specific again I mean he talks about Amanda and uh, Raffaele you know being there and he kind of now comes back at her in quite a robust way saying you, you have to understand the context and he gets quite heated and he said, you need to look at what the judge said on page 145. This is not in dispute. 
that they were acting, um, you know, that they were there, they went back early. Um, and, you know, that's how he explains it away. The, the judge said that he wasn't the one who, you know, who um, had the knife and, um, you know, dealt the final blow with the weapon, the coup de grace. Oh, well, that's actually not true, and it is in dispute. And the fact is that the case got thrown out against Rafael and Amanda and that they were actually declared innocent of the crime. And yet, I'm sure a lot of our listeners will see where where the judge panel also said that Rudy Gede did not act alone. Yeah, this is very confusing to people. It, Absolutely. it should be confusing because it is confusing. And, but I believe it's 100% based on the fact that Mignini had gotten the verdict against Gede in which Mignini presented that Gede did it in concert with two other people. He had gotten that verdict certified by the Supreme Court of Italy. And once that is done, it is a legal point of law. It can never be changed. You can't appeal it. And that's absurd. But he did it. And so the Supreme Court has to stand by its own certification. But when they actually looked at the facts and the evidence, which Mignini carefully hid from the defense and any outside eyes until the second or third or fourth trial. But once it was actually evaluated, it was found to be 100% fraudulent. It was not an accident. It was not a mistake. He suborned perjury. He bought out all these experts and, and put them in a position. He would, he would fire people if they weren't saying the things that he wanted them to say. But the people who actually had integrity and were actual scientists who disagreed with what his theory was, they didn't make it to, to testify. <laughs> Other people did. Right. And I mean, Franco says in this interview, well, we can't we can't debate the judge's decision. But I think, you know, as Lisa said, it is very confusing. Um, so I presume that's a legality in Italy that you can't talk about sort of, a, you know, the judge's yeah, um, decision sure. and, and position. She seems to really want to get off that topic. And then she throws to him, well, you know, you fled to Germany. Um, why did you go to Germany? And he sort of says, well, I have no idea how I got there. You know, it, it could have been Russia. And this, again, is where you see sort of him claim the victim role again. He goes back to this 20-year-old boy and that he, you know, no fear. fear. he was a man and he's trying to create distance, that's for sure. And I think just, you know, putting it in its context with um, Amanda Knox and Raffaele Selecito, you know, conversely, they did not run. Um, and I think that's quite interesting, you know, who trusts the system and we know why some people don't trust the system but I th whether it's naivety those two seem to but Guede then goes on to say well I skyped with my friend and this is a friend that he mentioned you know from childhood um, I'm not sure how you pronounce the name um, Giacomo um, saying that he skyped with him for four Gi hours Giacomo yeah. Giacomo mm -hmm. um, G-I-A-C-O-M-O yeah, Giacomo mm -hmm. and See you at the Italians and you know that. <laughs> Giacomo. Giacomo. Right? And, you know, he said his friend was trying to, to help the police, or she actually says that. Um, and so he's kind of saying, well, of course, I wasn't really fleeing because I was talking to my friend <laughs> on Skype for, for four hours, so I didn't just disappear. Yes, yet he threw away his clothing and all the other things that would tie him to the crime. Um, that he but, chooses not to right. give an account. He also of. specifically says, not knowing that he was being recorded, he specifically says, Amanda Knox was, was not, not there. there. He says that he has no reason to make that. A, why would he protect her? If I mean, at this point, the reason he why he bought about it up. Her at this point, though. Oh, there's plenty. There is, isn't there? When at this he point, is yes, talking he, to his friend in Koblenz when he's on the train on the way. I think in his Germany. friend has said that Amanda has been arrested. But he doesn't know her. He doesn't know any of the relevance. He doesn't know anything else. He just says that she wasn't there. Right, he but because her, the friend he brought her up, right. But he doesn't know all the detail of it. I mean, in this four no. hour, it's being, um, you know, it's the police who are directing this conversation. Right. He doesn't know all the detail of it. It's only afterwards he knows all the detail, which is why he says very clearly, well, she was never there. Right. But when the inconsistencies are, is that we see him placing her there once he understands the relevance of that. Right, and he clearly gets that from Mignini in the course of the, quote, interrogation by Mignini of Guede when he was brought back from Germany to Italy, when he was extradited there. 
Nini spends time with him and over and over and over again says, you must have seen her. She must have been there. You must have seen the knife. He tries to get him to say that there was this big knife. He tries to get him to say all this stuff. And Gede is not really biting most of the time, but eventually he he, he says has makes the silhouette speech, um, which, again, is just completely absurd and, and it's laughable. Um, but anyway... Mignini gets what he wants. He now this by this time, uh, Lamamba has already proven his his alibi, and it's clear that he had nothing to do with it. So he needed another black man to be there. Uh, so he was very happy to find Rudy Gede. And of course, that's you know why why the names of volunteer. But just going back to this particular section of the interview, because I, I again it was another very interesting point where. He kind of he's in Germany and he says that he was stopped at and then he can't remember where, which I think is quite interesting. And she says Koblenz. But he says, well, they didn't arrest me. And then you see them cut to um, a, a video or a still of him actually being escorted, you know, off the off the train and wearing handcuffs. So, you know, these little... What, did he lie? Are you saying that he I, lied? I think, more? you know, oh he's God. a relatively accomplished liar. This is the second time he didn't get arrested when he was arrested. But if they're going to bother showing that picture, why doesn't she call him, call him out on it? Well, I mean, sometimes these things are just left to hang. They put in post or something or yeah, in the Yeah, and, and that's yeah. the picture that you see in the Express of that's what he looked like then, which is a very different Rudy Guede sure. to this particular interview. Um, I mean, say part nine of of the um, the interview is she basically talks through, and again, I think this part's quite good, where she talks through all the forensics that were found um, that put him in that house at that time, and she talks about you know the vaginal swab, and he then says you know it's consensual, and she sort of reiterates that that there was consensual um, foreplay. And the DNA on the bra, the sweatshirt, the palm print, the Nike shoe print, which he says, yes, it was Nike outbreak. He volunteers that, that he wore. And she mentions the D- his DNA on the toilet paper. And I think then you get another little interesting bit of leakage that when she asks about Amanda Knox and why Amanda Knox would lie about Lumumba being there, he then says, well, you know, clearly she just wants to cover her ass. And you see him get quite... Um, vociferous at that point and then you see him kind of pull back you can almost see him uh, you know there's a yeah. there's a physiological the true come out yeah element to it where he says oh it's pardon my French you know it's a little slip again where he realizes that he's back in his true self and he wants to be presenting a very different image mm-hmm. so you know and the rest of it she asks him um about the the life sentence and he had a life sentence and it was reduced to 30 and that he wanted the fast track trial and she asks him well why did you want the fast track trial Um, or why did you agree to it and he says that he chose it due to his non-involvement which I thought I don't know if that's a the, the literal translation for it, but saying because I wasn't involved, I thought I would choose the fast track option. Is he saying because I'm innocent, I had nothing to fear from being fast tracked, or? Well, I'm not sure exactly what he means by that, um, he, because he talks specifically about um, the life sentence, and the judge basically saying that um, that there were more than there was more than one person. And then he, the, she mentions the Court of Appeal, December the 28th, 2009, which was actually Meredith Kircher's birthday, that they reduced it from 30 years to 16 because he had no criminal record and the assumption that he did not hold the knife. And then in December the 16th, 2010, the Supreme Court upholds, upholds its decision and he agrees to this fast-track trial and he chooses it because of his non-involvement. And it go, I think it goes back to this... You know, the judgment that says he did not deliver the final coup de grace, which is what she keeps bringing up, and he does too. Well, that he went along with others. It was their idea, yeah. and the judge is sort of making the point that he didn't ha- take his own initiative, but it was somebody else driving. Right, but that was all based on evidence that was actually false. The assumptions. Yes, yeah. and it just, it's just absurd. The crime scene um, analysis doesn't question. point to it. This interview that we've been going through, that was done in January of 2016, right? Right. So this was before the actual, the Supreme Court actually made a final determination that 
that was not the case, that, that Amanda and Raffaele were actually innocent. It's just people still are sticking to their belief that Amanda and Raffaele were guilty. Yes. Based on what? Chloe, this yeah. particular interview sure. ends with in a very interesting way. And it ends with seeing him in prison. Now it does cut to footage with him in prison. Um, and again, the violin music is playing and it talks about him being you know, really involved in his studies and that he's doing this very intellectual thesis on, on the media and you know, across time and across history and that he's in charge of, the cl of cleaning the infirmary and you know, he decided not to have his father visit him anymore. And then we see him, um, you know, an artist at work and she sort of laughs and smiles and said, and behind the scenes I've been talking to my informants and I found out you're a very talented artist and so you see it now cut to him painting. And then the sentimental music starts to get a little bit louder and you know, he talks about being a true Italian and that he wants to stay in Italy um, and that he's got his history degree and the whole uh, sort of overwhelming sense of it is this reformed character who's very cultured, who's very artsy um, and, you know, this kind of rehabilitated and a model prisoner. And she asks him about the retrial and he says, well, an innocent person, you know, of course, would not miss this opportunity for a retrial. And, you know, because I, I have um, had a sentence and I've served the years because I didn't call for help for her. But I, you know, the thing that sticks for me is the fact that I'm spending time in prison for um, a sexual assault and a murder that I didn't commit. And he distinguishes, you know, those things that he deserves, you know, some form of penalty for not calling for help. The things that he thinks people might judge him for. Mm -hmm. um, but he hints at the retrial and, of course, that is exactly what has happened. And that's sort of how it ends on this. Do you think that retrial came about because of the interview? Because he does seem so sympathetic in this interview to people who, you know, maybe not have followed the trials closely as we have. But do you think that this helped Sort of I think they strategically have to be planning things. Yeah. So, for example, knowing that the final, you know, determination from the Supreme Court could go either way if um, the two are, are found, um, you know, innocent or acquitted, and that there are problems around the forensics, and there's every likelihood because they didn't push for a retrial before. So, uh, I would say that the lawyer has been and lawyers have been very strategic here, and they've been building the platform to launch from. So having this interview, I would say it was strategically timed. The facts, you know, and how it was stylized and deciding to go with this particular um, interview, Frank Alicini, was a deliberate choice and no doubt there were terms and conditions placed around it that, that the story was told in a certain way. And he sets up a Facebook account and Twitter and, you know, they wait for the next things to land. I, yeah. I would say that, you know, absolutely they'd be strategizing next moves. What, would, what do you think, Yeah, Jim well, C? I think that what's crazy about this is, again, when he took it, the fast-track trial, he should have given up his rights to any kind of Appeal. appeals like this because, on the facts because the whole point was you're getting a shorter sentence because you're doing this fast-track trial. It's a, it's a quid pro quo. But he, they, they didn't require that of him. McNeeny didn't require that of him, nor did he require him to testify in the trial against Amanda and Raffaele. But if he's going to do this on the facts, it's possible that judges would believe him, that he didn't actually kill Meredith Kircher. But it's absurd, and based on the evidence, all the evidence points to him being the only person in that room when, when he killed Meredith, and that he is guilty of sexual assault and murder. And... But I, I've seen people like him, and I think we ought to talk a little bit about it before we break, just that um, he's charismatic, he's glib, he's articulate, he's intelligent, detail-oriented, a pathological liar, manipulative, yeah, and a criminal. And all those things are on the PCLR. Lacks empathy, shows no sign of remorse or responsibility taking. I mean, you know, the 20 traits, we're yeah. just ticking them off as the way that he presents. And those are the traits of a psychopath. And he is incredibly gifted at presenting himself as what he's not, selling himself. And it takes a trained eye 
like Laura and myself to actually see the holes in that story. And we've tried to point them out for the listeners. And we hope that you do listen to this interview and listen to it again after you've heard our analysis of some of these things and see if you see the indicators that we see that this guy is lying through his teeth, that he's more concerned about his image than he is concerned about the fact that, quote, his date was murdered feet away from he, him, and yet he let her die, and he did not call for help, and he fled the country only after, supposedly out of fear, but only after he went out dancing and drinking with his friend. It's just abominable. It is, and certainly, you know, we also, also like to hear from people who know, you know, the person the most or the best, and I think, you know, his foster father, for me, sums it up, the wealthy Caporali family, um, you know, her, his foster father basically said that he is a tremendous liar. Mm. And I have to say, I, I do, you know, concur with that. I think he's an accomplished liar. I think he's been doing it for many years and he's had a lot of time to think about, you know, the narrative. And he's had lawyers around him too. But I think all of this has been crafted um, and waiting for the right opportunity. And of course, you know, what has been said by the judge means th- that it opens the door. If there were multiple people, he wants that to be the point of focus. If he was one that was just taken along with others and there are problems with the investigation, with forensics, they're hoping that the door is now open and that retrial on December the 20th, I I sadly think is going to be rather interesting. It is. Um, But here's the thing. The fact is that if they have a trial on December 20th and it goes on any more than a, a few days or whatever, I mean, it's going to be a while before the decision comes down, and then they'll have to publish the motivations, which usually is 60 or 90 days later. Well, I think he's he's already eligible. Yeah, he's almost out right now. Right, and he's already out on day passes. And he can be out, and he chooses not to to do his studies, although he did come out for this dinner and for 72 hours. But I believe he's actually up for parole 2018. Um, Right, so another year from now he'll be he'll be up for parole anyway. I mean, it's almost like a fait accompli that he's getting out next year and it's just it's just terrific. It's mm. terrible for the family. The Kircher family who again, you know, this just opens everything up and keeps it, you know, an open and unresolved right. situation. But Although I, think... I believe we have gone through the detail and um answered quite a lot of their if if not all of their questions there are still some actually I think we still need to yeah. to go through but a lot of them within uh the podcast and of course you know we do it all in Meredith's name right um yep, we have her picture right here right but I do believe what you said is correct Lisa that this interview may have been the foundation upon which this appeal was granted to him because it does paint him in a way it's it's a lot like making a murderer here Mm. Um, that I think that uh, luckily Brendan Dassey who I do believe was actually innocent was is now being released um, from prison as a result of that documentary and I think this interview um, four hours in length clearly uh, bends over backwards to paint him as a as a wonderfully intelligent engaging charismatic young man um, it may have helped in the minds of, of the court and the minds of the people of Italy. I think people, a number of people in Italy, believe that they were um, sort of taken advantage of by Amanda Knox and Raphael Selecito, mm-hmm. mainly Amanda, uh, that she got away with murder and that, that, uh, that Meredith Kircher did not get justice. In fact, um, Meredith Kircher did not get justice, but it wasn't because of Amanda Knox. It was because of Magnini and because of the fact that he used Rudy Gede to try to trap Amanda and Raphael. And in the end, that that trap failed. And he should be professionally embarrassed. He should be prosecuted for that, uh, like he was in the Monster of Florence case. Yeah, we should actually do a whole thing on his background. It's we just should. really fascinating, and I, I think that we will. Let's um, do that. Before we sign off here at Real Crime Profile, I would like to make a recommendation, and that is Jason Flom's podcast, Wrongful Conviction, in which he interviews Amanda Knox and a couple of other people who were wrongfully convicted and then exonerated. 
Uh, he has been uh, one of the people in the forefront of the Innocence Project, one of the founding members of the Innocence Project, and has raised a lot of money for that project. I think it's a very laudatory uh, system that is now in place and has exonerated over 300 people who were wrongfully convicted. So mm -hmm. please listen to this podcast. Um, I think you'll be really intrigued. And if you want to hear more about the Innocence Project, I actually did an interview with Raquel Cohen of the California Innocence Project uh, a few months ago. So you can uh, learn even more about what they do, the really important work they do, too, if you kind of scroll back and find that pod. On Real Crime Profile. So thank you for listening. Uh, we, again, as Laura said, uh, are doing these podcasts in the hopes that it will clear up questions for family, friends, and, and other people interested in the, the case of the murder of Meredith Kircher and, of course, to help bring her justice. Her name was Meredith. So if you enjoy our podcast and would like to support us, there are a couple of important things you can do. First, you can go over to iTunes and give us a positive five-star review. You can check out our sponsors and take advantage of the special promotions for Real Crime Profile listeners. You can go over and like our Facebook page and you can follow us on Twitter. But most importantly, you can share our podcast with friends, family and anyone you know would be interested in real crime and the minds that solve those crimes. So thank you for listening. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineered by Terrell Parham. Music composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107 or you can go on the website www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Domestic Violence Helpline free phone 0800 2000 247. In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, safety, shelter or counselling, call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, 214-946-4357 or go on their website, www.genesisshelter.org or the domestic violence hotline on 800-799-7233. If you're a regular listener to the show, you know we have great brands like Blue Apron, Audible, and Casper advertising with us, and they keep coming back because our listeners really respond to them, which we're really thankful for. Well, if you happen to own a business or manage the advertising buy for one, then you should consider advertising on Real Crime Profile. Podcast advertising is on the rise, and it's one of the most effective ways of reaching consumers on the go today. So please go to Wondery.com slash advertisers. Again, it's Wondery.com slash advertisers. And get in touch with us. Thanks.